We've got a second uh, set of guidance on the growth, some growth topics from the panel, 22nd of March, um, 2016. That should be 15 apologies. Um, so, key things to read out there, um, they, they didn't support the intervention in the housing market through prices and home ownership, so that was a bit of a signal they didn't like the affordable housing provisions in the, in the regional policy <coughs> statement, and foreshadowing that they might have some issues with the rules in the district plan for affordable housing, and we have reported that back to committee. The thinking may have moved on, it may not, we can't tell with any of this. Uh, new rural and, and coastal villages, so we, in the unitary plan there's, there's quite a strong uh, policy statement against new rural settlements outside the rural urban boundary. The, the notion is to take the existing rural settlements and expand them, if, if appropriate, but not to create new settlements. But the panel, um, at this point in time, or as of uh, March last year, felt that there, sh there should be a possibility of new rural settlements provided certain criteria met. Uh, they didn't believe in distinguishing between rural settlements that are unserviced with um, wastewater and ones that are unserviced. I'm not entirely sure what that point was all about. If you've got questions, I'm sure Chloe will know because she was the lead on this uh, topic. Uh, interesting one, they, they didn't um, consider um, social infrastructure to be the same as uh, other forms of infrastructure. They wanted to draw a clear distinction. And I guess the issue there is that um, we felt, council's experts felt, uh, and I guess with your direction going into the hearings, that uh, social infrastructure are also networks in much the same way as um, transport infrastructure and that a lot of the wording in the unitary plan had been deliberately crafted, drafted, to um, cater for both schools, hospitals, um, and so on, as well as uh, water, wastewater, linear infrastructure as well. So anyway, that's where the panel was coming from. Got a sense that they wanted to split them and treat them quite differently. Uh, and they did support um, commercial growth on <coughs> transport corridors as well as in centres. And so that was a bit of a signal they felt there was possibly a need to free up on some of the restrictions on office and retail development outside of centres, although, um, again, a lot of time has moved on since this hearing here, which was very much at the high level. We've had a, a hearing on uh, the very detailed level of um, retail and office, and perhaps the panel's view has um, moved on. So that's the first chapter. It probably is the biggest, most all-encompassing of the eight chapters in the RPS. So Chloe and I more than happy to answer questions. So we'll just take some questions, <coughs> questions of clarification. Councillor Walker and Councillor Webster. Where we've got a, a change that the panel's signalling, and there are a few of them here, uh, there's around the rub, um, social facilities, um, for example. Would it be fair to say that there'll be things that we could considerably, uh, conceivably um, challenge because they're at a high level while they are connected to what's below. They're, they're sending a signal, and if, and if anything, it's, it may be easier to make some changes here if we can substantiate them than if, if there are changes further below yep. that may be impacted by both the changes that they're suggesting below and above. Am I making sense? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing we need to say is, um, you know, it's, it's an open public meeting. The panel may well be listening to this meeting, so we have to be quite careful in, in, in how we give advice on potentially rejecting the panel's recommendations <coughs> in the future. But as we mentioned at the last meeting, the council can reject uh, any recommendations from the panel, but it must put forward an alternative approach, and that alternative approach must be based on evidence that was before the panel. So uh, to go back to the notified plan is quite possible, so if we disagreed with the panel's guidance, yes, anything is possible, um, but whether that's a wise thing to do or not is something we'll be giving you advice when it comes to the time in July. I think there's also the issue that what we discussed last time is that rejecting aspects of the regional policy statement has a knock-on effect yeah. down to the lower levels of the plan and the more parts of the plan that we reject the less likely it will become effective and operative so the panel, <coughs> the council needs to consider really carefully if it wants to reject elements at the higher level of the RPS because that's the thing that sets the platform for everything else but as John says, we don't know what the recommendations of the panel will be at this stage, 
once we do, um, we will obviously identify to you where their recommendations are at odds with what this council position has been at the hearings. Okay, got a, got a follow-on question. In an instance where there has been some interim guidance, and let's say that's sparking some, some warning bells on our part, um, say it's around social facilities, say it's around the rub or, or the like, uh, are we doing a bit of homework around those sorts of issues in advance, given that we're going to have a pretty constrained time frame later? So, so where we felt strongly the panel was perhaps heading in the wrong direction, we at subsequent hearings uh, took the opportunity to really stress our reasoning as clearly as possible. So, And often we brought that through to committee and got a direction from you that no, we should hold the line for now, and so at the subsequent hearings on the rules, we were often quite clear with extensive evidence to really bolster our original position. That's the best we've done so far. Going forward, um, our team here are starting to do some thinking around um, where we might need to go, but um, that's very early days yet, and um, it was mainly that second opportunity at any subsequent hearings to really drive things home and present the best case possible. So we did that in many cases. So just to let people know, I've got Councillor Webster, Casey, Anai, Lee and Cashmore. Mine's just a <clears throat> very quick, um, on that interim guidance from panel on growth, 20 March, you, did you mean 2015, not 2016? Yeah. 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 Sorry, I'm just, because Sorry. these are going to be yeah. quite important documents, so I want to make sure oh, what we'll comes make, first. So before we hand these out, any wider, we need to make sure that's changed. Thank, Thank you. you. Councillor Casey. I'd like to know the evidence that the panel produced to support their interim guidance on uh, non-intervention on housing, and also that social, social facilities are not infrastructure. The first point, the panel didn't mm -hmm. call evidence place. itself, but others presented evidence, so you mean evidence from other submitters. Um, what did they use to come yeah, to Yeah, they that would have conclusion? used evidence from other submitters. So, I Which mean, we can, yeah. Chloe, can you answer that? Otherwise, we do have our leads on I think, affordable housing. Yeah, I, yep. I, I can see Councillor Casey's question is valid. However, given the fact that we have a huge amount of information to get through today, Good. we no, that, that may be a discussion to have directly, I think, Councillor Casey, but the bottom line is, I think I heard Councillor Quack say this is all on the, on the panel's website. This was <coughs> interim guidance from the panel based on all the submissions they heard. Their explanation and their evidence is available on their website and it would be but good if, to have if a look. we want to object to something, and there's a council case in now, remember you. today, this is simply us, Second we're going July. through the in updates, the and at this stage we're not discussing acceptance or rejection, that's when we come to the actual debate. This is just being reminded of exactly. where have we got to, yeah. what's the process, what's the information, and reminding people this huge huge piece of work over five years, what all the components are. Okay. Sorry, Madam Chair, but we, we can certainly provide that information yeah. after the meeting to councillors. Yep. That'll be useful, It'll be really yeah. useful. Um, yep, I've got Councillor and I next. Uh, thank you, just on interim guidance 20 March, can you expand on no need to distinguish between serviced and unserviced buildings? Certainly, um, through the Chair. So in the RPS, um, the rural and coastal towns and villages have got sort of essentially <coughs> two categories for the rural and coastal villages, and that's an unserviced village and a serviced village. Yeah. And the reason for that is, um, it goes back to the Auckland Plan, which categorises those villages, and the um, ability for those villages to accommodate growth based on their capacity of infrastructure. So there's a slightly different emphasis on um, Settlements, uh, villages, service villages are anticipated they could accommodate a bit more growth, whereas an unserviced village, you don't really want to encourage a whole lot of growth in there because then that's going to put pressure on the council <coughs> and the council's um, CCOs to actually start servicing them. So that's the differentiation, and essentially the panel didn't think that differentiation needed to be made. Um, the other point is that the entry plan indicates a rub will be um, applied to service villages around that growth issue and not to unserviced villages. So just 
further on that. So what you're saying is the service has got infrastructure in place already Certainly. and the unservice doesn't. That's right. But they're not differentiating between the two. Yep. They don't they don't believe we need to, but that, but we have, yeah. They haven't said any great anything more than that really about why they don't think it needs to be distinguished. So we can't debate that now with they've just said that we might agree or disagree, but that's simply a clear statement of what they believe. Um, it was a clear statement what they believed on the 20th of March last year, and as John has said, they made it very clear with these interim guidances that it was only guidance at that point in time, and they reserved their right to change their minds or their position after they'd heard other evidence. So we actually don't know what they're going to recommend in their final situation. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Lee. Yes, um, the, the notion that the regional urban rural boundary will be recommended by the panel to be a district plan matter um, is a worry. It's, it's not really logical. Um, and the idea of setting a rural urban boundary or a metropolitan urban limit Quakes. goes back to the Councillor, when regional on, planning Councillor first began. Councillor Quakes, you have a point of order? Yeah, Madam Chair, um, I'm, I'm starting to be, get a little uncomfortable with the way the direction uh, is going because we're, we're in danger of debating mm. these issues now before we get any kind of direction or any kind of uh, recommendation from the panel. And I, I see it's an exercise of futility to sit around now and debate. That's not a point of order. No. Which well, may or may not come. And it is a point of order, Madam Chair. It is absolutely I'm, a point of happy, order. And I'm happy with that. We're so let's not waste here. time debating the point of order. I agree. Councillor Quax, you're right. Councillor Lee, I was making notes. Well, I'll tell you this saying. now, in Can unitary I, plan Council, panel, Council, there's going to be a hell of a fight if you try that one. <laughs> Wow, Councillor Lee, take a deep it, breath. Let's actually you. remember why we're here, and why we're here I represent the is public. to... Councillor Lee, oh. Oh. we're here to actually be updated on the interim guidance, on the submission process, and to remind people who may not have attended all the meetings or who may not have participated in the process how we got to where we got to. This is, as Councillor Quack says, not the time to debate the issue. A, we risk putting ourselves in legal harm's way, and B, we don't have all the information in front of us. So debating it now is a futile effort. Um, Councillor Cashmore. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a bit of clarification, John, if I may. So the rural urban boundary, when they're talking about a, a degree of flexibility in that for a private plan change process, is that going to be a separate little circle outside that rural rural boundary or it has to be continuous to it so it could be a bulge on the side for instance? Well I guess we don't know until we see what they come back with in the recommendations but it's it could go either way I mean they could say it has to be contiguous with existing boundary or it could be completely separate um, we, we don't know yet so either way is possible depending on where they land. Yeah. Okay good question. Um, Mr Thomas. Um, John, in the summary of submitters views on page four, you, you sort of make some qualitative comments about what submitters thought on urban form, um, but not so with infrastructure providers. And I'm just wondered, wondering if there wasn't more of a qualitative comment that you were able to draw out of the submissions from infrastructure providers. What's the one from Chloe? I mean, I there, there was certainly um, general support for uh, a more compact urban form and certainly coordination in the greenfield areas when new land comes on stream. Other than that, uh, and, and Auckland Transport and Watercare, two of the biggest infrastructure providers, were part of the council's team, so they didn't make a separate submission. So AT and Watercare supported that approach in the RPS, provided evidence on behalf of council on that approach in the RPS. In terms of other infrastructure providers, the key ones, I guess, will be NZTA, uh, uh, Transpower, Chloe, do you recall? Yeah. Uh, they sat with the um, 
Yeah, yes. I mean, I think the, the infrastructure providers, as John said, were generally supportive of the compact form and, to, and, and the coordination of infrastructure and not wanting to end up being dragged all across and, <coughs> into different <coughs> right. parts of the region all at the same time. But a big focus of the of their submissions was really about protecting their existing infrastructure as well and the reverse sensitivity sort that's of right. effects of development around that. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of what I'm looking for because what, what we know they submitted together, we know Auckland Transport and Watercare certainly have different <coughs> views on aspects of the plan. And I guess I'm just sort of clarifying the fact that, that in terms of the overall urban form, there was, there was alignment and then obviously there was a degree of difference of opinion in the detail and that was sort of worked through as part of the process. 